Hasidus has an expression. Oyer Haseichel. The light of ideas. Uh, the expression Oyer is used in Hasidus for pretty much everything. You would use the word Oyer for basically any aspect of spirituality and life. You would, you would employ, you would use the expression Oyer. What is the meaning of the light of an idea? Ideas are form, intellectual form, which is argued and proven, or at least explained, within the parameters, within the framework, within a box of certain laws of logic. And there are, of course, various boxes. There's a philosophical box, there's a scientific box, there's a psychological box, there's a spiritual box. And in each framework, the criteria for an argument and for a proof and for logic is a bit different. And an idea is something that conforms and has passed the test, so to speak, of that particular intellectual realm or world's criteria for what a legitimate idea or theory is. But what is the meaning of the light of an idea? What does it mean that an idea has a oir, a light, a lichtekeit? There are several significant insights into the meaning of this uh, allusion, this phrase. What does it mean, an idea? The oir aseich, the light of an idea. The first and the most basic, and perhaps the most important, is this. It is axiomatic to Hasidus, to Torah. In Lahavdal El Fafi Abdullah, this is how uh, ancient philosophers thought, and this is it's in stark contrast to how the modern scientist thinks, of course, or maybe not, of course, that ideas precede reality or the material reality. Every physical thing, before it was a physical thing, was a metaphysical uh, simile, a metaphysical idea. In, in science today, one of the very critical components of the cutting edge of science is the idea of information. That information is never lost and so on. But the idea that information precedes matter is not yet part of the scientific paradigm. It's only that information is the product, is created by matter, and once information is created, it's never destroyed, and of course the question becomes where is that matter, information stored, and so on. But in, in Torah, in Hasidis, the notion is that ideas come before material. In other words, a table is a physical thing. Before it was a thing, it was an idea. Now that's a very, very simple truth, because ideas, were, tables were created by people, and a person created a table because it served a purpose for him. So first he conceived of a table, then he created the table. But the question becomes, what about the person himself? Who conceived the person? And in Torah, and in Hasidus, and in Kabbalah, everything comes from Hashem. And as a consequence, before there was the reality of the many, many different creations that God Almighty made, there were the ideas that preceded them. And the concept or the ideas that came before the material, before the reality, is the basis for the reality as it manifests. In other words, Kvayocha, the Ebishtah's mind, so to speak, there's a notion of man, and therefore there is the actualization, there's the materializing of physical man. And we are the replication, we are the manifestation of the idea of man as it exists on a theoretical level first, and then on an actual level uh, second. So this is the first concept of ideas being oid, lichtigkeit, because all ideas precede the matter that represents them or that manifests them. So we use the word oid or light to represent the spiritual source of what will later be physically manifested. This is one concept. This is a, a very, very uh, Practical, very real and significant concept from a theological perspective, from understanding creation and our relationship with the Creator and so on. But it's obviously much more involved. There's many aspects to this. Taking it to a, a finer level, it's really the same thing in other words, but in a much more personal level, 
The reason we use the terminology, the lichtekite, the light of ideas, is for the following reason. The understanding of chesidus and teira is, if a human being invents an original idea, someone is the creator or the discoverer of a new idea, a new concept, a new thought, a new mathematical uh, system or paradigm or law, whatever the case is. Well, is a chidish and teira, new ideas in teira. Where did the idea come from? Now, all of us know the process that brought the idea forward. Right? The idea emerged because of questions. People have questions, the things they don't understand, it makes them curious, it makes them frustrated, it makes them upset, and they explore. And their curiosity and their frustration and their desire to know the truth compels them to search and seek and explore and probe, and then an idea emerges. So we know the process of how ideas come to the consciousness of a person. But where were they before they were in the consciousness of the person? And of course, this is critical. This is key. Taylor believes that before any idea existed physically, it existed metaphysically, spiritually. And one of the places where ideas exist before they manifest into the actual level of ideas that you can understand yourself and communicate with others through speech and so forth is in the Nishama. The human soul, as we discussed in yesterday's Shir, has a level called Kecha Maskil, which is called Kecha Yuli of Seichel. And higher than Kecha Maskil, there's something called Kecha Yuli Ha'atzmi of Seichel. And higher than Kecha Yuli Atzmi of Seichel, there's something called Yechelis of Seichel. These are various levels of the Nishama which will not be explained in tonight's class. And the argument is that the higher you go in the subconscious and essence of the Nishama, the more abstract and the more unified and the less actual ideas are. But the light of any idea that will later emerge from the essence to the subconscious and the subconscious to the consciousness already existed in those levels of the neshama. And when an idea is brought forward from subconscious to the consciousness, even though the process involves something external, you, f- you get an idea because you need it. You need it because you have a question and because you have a problem and because you have a difficulty that forces you to explore and to probe and to invent. In the final analysis, in other words, even though it's things outside of you that make you explore the idea, discovering the idea is actually finding it within yourself. You don't find it in the world, you find it in yourself. In other words, any intellectual concept that any human being ever created came from his neshama. But as it exists in the neshama, it's not an idea, it's a light, it's a oir. And this is the reason we speak about oir haseichel, the light of ideas. In Hasidis, there is a topic called oir chayes and koyach, which light, life, and energy. Of the three, I believe, I don't know this for sure, but I suspect, I believe, that koyach, energy, means physical energy. Life is already metaphysical, ruchnius, the neshama is living. And light, light, as opposed to life, is not only metaphysical and spiritual, it's infinite and unified. Every idea that a human being understands down here on this physical earth and his physical mind started out as light and then became life and then gave life to a physical brain and that physical brain then processed it and gave it a physical form which allows them to think it and to speak it and then to act on it. And this is the reason we speak of the light of ideas, the oir aseich, which of course makes the word enlightenment meaningful. The, the, the term enlightenment as it's used in our culture and our civilization has a very, very spiritual connotation, a very new age connotation. In other words, it's not associated with intellect, it's associated with spirituality, with emotion, even with sensuality, but it's not associated with ideas. But in Hasidis, enlightenment, whatever the Hebrew parallel for enlightenment would be, is very real. And I'll tell you why. Because acquiring knowledge from a Hasidic perspective, from a mystical perspective, from a Torah perspective, which involves, of course, struggling with the world, the questions that the world presents to you, the questions that the Torah gives you, and so on, that force you to probe. So on the one hand, it's the world around you and the Torah that's around you that's provoking you to search. But the actual finding of resolution, the actual getting of answers 
to your questions and to your curiosities and to your frustrations is not coming from outside of you. Outside of you triggers it, stimulates it. But the process of gaining knowledge is actually the neshama giving it to you. And of course, the process of the neshama giving it to you has two perspectives. From the conscious perspective, you're reaching up. What we call chokhmah, you're bitterling yourself to what's above you. And from the perspective of the neshama, it's descending, which is the, the nekuda, the point, which is called nekuda saskala, the point of an enlightenment, of an idea, which is the very, very lowest level of the subconscious of the neshama that touches like a spark, like a flash, the highest level of the, the nekuda, of this, the consciousness of the person. And there is a moment of enlightenment, which is called that barakamavrik, a light, a flash. And then, of course, you must take advantage of it and process it and make it into a comprehensible and thorough and managed and departmentalized idea. So the word enlightenment is truly an intellectual concept. In other words, notwithstanding how it's understood in some cultures, we're not using the word enlightenment in the prophetic sense. And to be sure, I want you to know that according to Torah, prophecy is also very deeply connected to the intellectual process. Prophecy is really just the neshama speaking to the mind by skipping a few steps. In other words, it's also very much an intellectual process. As the Rambam says, you can't be a prophet unless you're a chocham. And a chocham means not just a pretty bright guy. It means a deeply engaged, sensitive intellectual with a pure body and a pure mind and a singular focus and so on. So enlightenment really is the neshama giving you something. And when you learn Hasidus and you explore this approach, and the approach says, if you understood anything, your neshama gave it to you. In other words, even though there's so many things outside of you that are the triggers and the provokers and the stimulators of that discovery, the actual source of the idea, of the new information, or the new understanding of that information, came from the neshama in the form of light. When light descends from the level of light to the level of life, and when it descends from the level of life on a level which is called chayis koli, general life, to life on a specific level which is called chayis prati, which is the chayis of the seichel, and when it descends from the level of a chayis prati to a seichel prati, you have a new idea. You understand the new concept. So the neshama gives you ideas. When a new idea emerges from your subconsciousness to your consciousness, it's a specific, specific intellectual life that comes from the general intellectual life, which comes from the general life of your person, which comes from the general light or the infinity of your neshama. So Hasidus makes an observation. And it was sort of mentioned in the last class. It was the middle madrega on page of Gimel in a way, that oftentimes, or on occasion, a person will experience in his conscious mind a light, but he doesn't understand anything. In other words, sometimes there's an enlightenment that doesn't go through the Ishtal steps. Your conscious mind feels an enlightenment, a richness. It's not an idea, because you don't understand anything, and you can't repeat it to somebody else, and you certainly can't argue it and prove it. But in your mind there is oir, enlightenment. That experience of having in your conscious mind oir, that's not yet brought down to a level of chayas or seichel, and specifically a seichel, a chayas or a seichel prati that you can understand and put into words and prove and debate and argue, is a makif-like idea. Makif in this case doesn't mean hidden. Makif means available only and directly. You can enjoy that enlightenment, you can feel that enlightenment, but you don't have the ability to manage it. You can't put words to it, you can't put proofs to it, you can't put things to it, and you certainly can't put argument, which you can't share it with another and argue and defend it. Because it's an enlightenment, it exists in your mind in an indirect way. You experience oir in your moyach, your mind is experiencing light, that light is not attached to any word, that light is not attached to any specific idea. So you're experiencing what Hasidus would call an intellectual richness that is from a perspective of intellect in this world, which means to be able to say it and to argue it and to prove it, it doesn't exist. Hasidus says about Shleimah Melech, that, and this is the Alter Rebbe brings the Maimodim, and Abzalman Zezmer was in this Madriga. Chocham Be'etzim Ke'echach Mosi. I don't have time to explain at length what this means, but a chocham be'etzim ke'echach means a person who is so sensitive intellectually 
that he can understand the light of his neshama that has no relationship with the words whatsoever. You have Chachma Salach Kimen. And Chasida says, if you have that kind of sensitivity where you can relate to the intellectual enlightenment or light of ideas that have no words, you can understand things that are incredibly sensitive, incredibly abstract, incredibly, incredibly esoteric, but you have no ability to tell it to anybody else. And you certainly have no ability to argue it and to prove it. So you may know things in your mind and they're sasum, they're sealed. There's no way for you to communicate them. Which is part of how Hasidus explains why Shleim HaMelech speaks in riddles. Choyd Chido. Because Shleim HaMelech is attempting to hide the enlightenment of the Oira Seichel, which did not come down to a Madrega of Shefa or Chayas or Seichel Kloli or Prati, so that he can tell it to you directly. So he gives you these riddles and he hopes you'll extrapolate, you'll go from the Moshal to the Nimshal, from the Moshal to the Nimshal and from the Chida to the to the Pisrei Nachida and somehow extract the very, very refined and abstract enlightenment that Shleim HaMelech is experiencing that he can't put into words, he can't argue and prove and debate and so on. This is the concept of Oyer HaSeichel. So when we use the word Oyer HaSeichel, there's two points on here that are being discussed. Number one, it's revealed, it's experienced. Number two, we're speaking specifically about an Oyer HaSeichel which is not an actual seichel. In other words, anytime you understand something, that's called a seichel. The neshama went through a symptom and a second symptom and a third symptom until you have seichel, kloli, prati, a seichel, which is the slavish and oisis of seichel, that you're able to understand that you can then share with somebody else and prove and debate and so on. Replicate. But a seichel means when you have an enlightenment in your mind that doesn't have any words, it doesn't allow for you to process it intellectually in your own mind and certainly doesn't allow for you to communicate to somebody else, but it's real. You experience it consciously. Why am I saying this all? Why did I start tonight's class with this uh, premise, with this introduction? The, the short answer, the immediate answer is because last week, or the last shir. I explain to you, I try to explain to you the difference between philosophy and mysticism as it relates to ideas. Philosophy, Hakira, like the Rambam, like the Asag, like the Beis of Albu, like Yehuda Halevi, they were, wrote classic works of philosophy. Philosophy is very different than Kabbalah and Hasidus, mysticism and Hasidism, not only because they have different criteria for what is an idea, or how they come to the ideas. Philosophy comes to ideas from the world, and Kabbalah Hasidus comes to ideas, the word Kabbalah connotes, from the Abish, it's an enlightenment, it's a revelation. It's a it's a nevuah, whatever you want to call it, as it's discussed in the Gersa Kedesh, Yutes and Tanya. The difference is not only what they understand and how they understand it and where the information comes from, but there's something much, much more deep. And that is that philosophy's ability to understand doesn't entail this element of enlightenment that I'm describing. I see, certainly not in, in some schools of thought. There are philosophers who believed in prophecy and philosophers didn't believe in prophecy and the difference between those two schools of thought would be the difference that I'm trying to illustrate right here now. Philosophy is intellect and philosophy is based on proof. The principles of philosophy is that you're able to argue and prove certain things as being necessary or absolute based on questions and answers and debate. In other words, there's one issue that to prove that there, need, there needs to be a God, there's a necessity for a creator, and there's another issue to explain what the creator is. Proving that Hashem exists is not enlightenment, it's, it's, it's necessity. Understanding what Hashem is should be an enlightenment. And this is where there's a difference between mysticism and Hasidism and philosophy. Because in Kabbalah and Hasidus, there is a very broad and deep and serious linking of the mind and the soul. One of the expressions which represents this very basically is the expression Pnimius Abba Pnimius Atik. The depth of your mind is the depth of your soul. Now, in the, the literal translation of the words Pnimius Atta Pnimius Atik has to do with the Lakus and the Milo, but this is how it is in the person as well. There is a relationship between the Sosim of Chochmah and the Sosim of the Etzaman 
In other words, ideas come from the soul. And ideas on the highest levels are incredibly close to the soul. Which is why there is a point at which something ceases to be an idea and begins to be an enlightenment. And it's almost a gradation. It's almost a step after a step after a step. You try and understand Hashem on one level and you go to a higher level. And of course, the higher you go, the more abstract you go until you get to a point where you can no longer understand it. You can't put it into words. And again, one of the basic definitions of understanding something is that you can explain it to somebody else, prove it to somebody else, and argue it. There becomes a point where that ceases to be possible. And there is still levels of understanding beyond that until there's a level of enlightenment. Where the neshama enlightens the consciousness of the person with a sense of truth about Hashem that doesn't have words, that you can't understand yourself, and they certainly can't explain it to somebody else, and yet it's real, it's true. In philosophy, that doesn't exist. In philosophy, assuming we're going in that, even if a philosopher doesn't believe in a vua, where the mind ends, knowledge ends. If I can't, prove something, if I can't argue something, if I can't uh, logically give form to something that I think theoretically it isn't real, it isn't true, and it's, uh, it's, it's just not there. In other words, if I may use different language, in Hasidus and Kabbalah the intellect has a certain warmth. The warmth of the intellect of Kabbalah is not the understanding, it's that what I'm understanding I also know. In other words, when I understand Hashem, the seichel of Elokus gives me a connection to the hergish of the Elokus itself, the sense of the godliness itself. Or to use different language, the chayis gives me a connection to the yoyir. When I'm understanding God as intellectually, that's a piece of my neshama that I have. And that little light of my neshama, which is in my mind, is connected to the infinity of my neshama. And what I'm understanding gives me a sense of enlightenment beyond what I could understand. That's the experience of my neshama, and that experience is the experience of godliness in philosophy that doesn't exist. So that's the idea of oyer haseichel, at least how we're using it in this conversation. It's the level of an idea which is not yet an idea and yet it entirely real. So I discussed in the last shir that when you talk about understanding things about godliness based on the world, what we call in our culture mamalekala, yedia sachiyuv in the language of the Ramba, the difference between the cold understanding of the philosopher and the warm understanding of the mystic and the, and the Hasidism, Hasidic expert is small. You don't see it. But when you go to Shlila, when you ascend to a level of understanding, where you're not understanding Hashem based on the world, but you're extrapolating, you're saying, based on what I know about God from the world, I must say there is more to God than the world tells me. And I go backward. I say, Hashem is not this, and Hashem is not that, Hashem does not have parts, and Hashem does not have uh, moods, and Hashem does not have all kinds of other divisions that the world suggests to me about Him, and when I extrapolate backwards, I'm going from Chiyif to Shlila, for understanding Hashem directly, because I'm actually understanding the world, and, and the world is becoming the basis for my understanding of Him, to understanding Him indirectly, because the world does not suffice, the world is not giving me this information, I'm using the world as a way of getting past the world. So in Chakira, you end up in a cold place. You have a sense of the transcendence. In other words, you understand how God is beyond what you understand. But understanding that Hashem is beyond what you understand does not have any oir. It doesn't give you any closeness to HaKadosh Baruch. But in Kabbalah and Hasidus it does. Because the Neshama has a level that represents and reflects all Madregas of the Neshama, the conscious level, the subconscious levels, and even the essence, as you're going to see in Mitzvah tonight. tonight. And as a consequence, when you extrapolate, when you go past what you can understand directly, and Bederach Tfisa and Hislapshus and Halbasha and, and, and Yasoga, to relating to Lakus on a level of Shlila, indirect knowledge, even though you're not understanding Lakus, you're simply acknowledging that you don't understand, there is an enlightenment in that. That enlightenment is called Hafla. It's the light of the subconscious. This is really a elaboration and a repetition of what I said at the conclusion of the class I gave you previously. But this also has a limit. This also has a limit. And the limit, which I will now present, is the pre prelude, is the segue to tonight's class. In Sha'ar Yichad Vemuna, where the Alter Rebbe discusses, of course, Achtas Hashem, the unity of God. 
a very, very interesting turn of events develops. That's how I guess, how, how I understand it at least. You start off assuming that there's a world and then you discover that the world is one with God. First it's dependent upon God and then it's simply the concealment of God and then it's godliness itself. Okay? Hisafas b'chol rega, v'ayu alikim, and the tzimtzum shalei kipshote. When you're done with the exploration of Achtas Hashem, intellectually you are in a place that says there's nothing, only Hashem. Which opens up Shara Yicha the Muna chapter eight, Pedik Ches, with what which with what is in effect a question. If it's true, then Ainuid Mulvade. That makes the Torah into a big lie. Bereshis Bottle the Kim Sashmay Vesar, it's never happened. Ainuid Mulvade. Bayemir the Kim Hiyay, never happened. Ainuid Mulvade. And the Al Tereb is bothered by that question. Now, he doesn't use the form I just gave you. How could the Tehidah say Hashem created the world if nothing exists? He uses a different language. And the language which he uses with my embellishment, with my understanding, would go something like this. When we say, Eynoid Mulvadeh, when we say that Achtas Hashem tells us that nothing exists besides for Hashem. And we therefore ask ourselves, what about all the illusions in Teirah and in Chazal and of course in Kabbalah? That there are all of these things and levels and realities that so to speak emerge and radiate from Him. Ein Eid Mavad doesn't allow for any of them. There is a basic division. There's two groups. One group is not such a difficult thing to understand. But the other group is very difficult to understand. Which group is, difficult, is easier to comprehend? The category of ideas that we learn about in creation, that Achtas Hashem says is false, are those categories in creation that the Torah says are not real. For example, Gashmias, Yeshus, Klipa. Torah says Hashem created a facade, a figment of our perception. In reality, what we perceive is untrue. So you, don't, you can't really ask a question, how could the Theta say Hashem created the world if the world doesn't exist? And the answer is because the world only exists to us, it doesn't exist to Him. So any aspect of the creation model, the, the story of creation in other words, and any aspect of what the creation model describes as having been created, which Theta calls Sheker, we explain by simply saying, Dibra, Tehidah, Kalash, and everybody other words, our perspective. We perceive it this way. But you see, some of the things that the Tehidah describes, Tehidah says are true. For example, it ain't safe. Does it exist? Esesfiris, do they exist? Here, the question is much more sensitive because Tehidah doesn't say that Esesfiris are a lie. Tata doesn't say that Eid Saf, meaning save of Kalaman is a lie. Tata says these things are true. In other words, if Tata says Hashem creates a world and Tata goes ahead and says, you know, this world doesn't really exist, it's just your perspective, your perception, fine. So the truth is Achtas Hashem and we think otherwise because we're blind. But if Tata says that Tata holds that it's true, for example, the SS Fetus of Atzilis, for example, the save of Kalam, which is higher than Atzilis, you can't make those things disappear based on the fact that they aren't true. Tata considers them real. And the Alter Rebbe struggles, three chapters, 8, 9, and 10, with this question. You know, you have the expression, Nitne Rishus Lechach Me'emes Ledaber Kain, that the Chazal gave the, the Mekubalim permission to speak about Svidis, and to speak about Sevev Kalam, to make it easier for us to understand that even though none of those things exist. So I'm going to repeat what I said again. Ach, Hashem doesn't allow for anything to be. So when it comes to those parts of what is, that Torah says is Sheker, the solution, the answer to the question about Achtas Hashem versus the world is, the world doesn't really exist, we think it does. But when it comes to the question that those things that Torah says are emes, like Svidis and like Sevev Kalam, as it's against the backdrop, as it's juxtaposed against the perspectives, as Eneid Mavad, it becomes much, much more difficult to address, and there's much discussion in explaining what we mean and why we mean and why we use those illusions. 
So in this conversation of Shara Yichad Vemunah, Perakam Chestas and Yud, where the Alter Rebbe is talking about things that are real, Esas Vidas, Sev of Kalaman, and Atzmos Amhoz, and he's trying to figure out how there could be two truths, A, Ein Eid Mulvadid, there's nothing besides for him, and B, Esas Vidas, and Sev of Kalaman, and higher than Sev of Kalaman, there's a very, very interesting detail that comes along with this involved conversation. And the detail goes as follows. That there's three levels. And this is really what I wanted to get to. There's three levels. The first level is Mamalek Kalama, which is called Esas Sviris. When it comes to Mamalek Kalama, called the Sviris of Atilis, we say, Ma... The Chochmah in Elokus can be understood by studying the Chochmah in a person. The Chesed in Elokus can be understood by studying the Chesed in a person. In other words, the ability to understand the, the Mida aspect, the Tzvidah Savatzilis, is based on our understanding of ourselves. And we can understand it directly. I can understand what the spheres are through the system, through the principle, through the philosophy. Like it says in the Yerzak Kedish, the Tazvav, Mipsari Study yourself and you understand spheres. But that's only true in Mamalik alone. When it comes to Save of Kalaman, when it comes to godliness, which is above the spheres, so the Alter Rebbe says, you can't know them directly, you can only know them indirectly, which is consistent with the point I made in the introduction that I gave you today about how flaw. Some things you understand and some things you can sense their light. You can experience the enlightenment of them. In other words, you know them, but you don't know them intellectually. You only know that in your intellect there is light that represents them, that brings them to you, that establishes that they're true. So those are two levels. The S is Sfidis, Mamale Kalaman, you can actually understand. Sfidis, St. Ketz, or Save of Kalaman, you can't actually understand, but you can have a sense of them. What about God Almighty Himself, the Abish to Himself? So the Al Rebbe uses a fascinating expression. Al Rebbe says that when it comes to understanding the Abish to Himself, not only can you not understand them directly, not only can you not understand them indirectly, but the effort to understand them is a joke. And he gives you an example. If someone is going to say, Al Seichel Omuk, She'i Efshe Lemashe Shabi Yadayim Kol Hashemei Yitzchak that you come along and say, listen, I have this concept. It's quite esoteric. It's quite abstract. I can't touch it with my physical hands. It's a joke. It's laughable. So the Alter Rebbe infers that when we're attempting to understand Atmos and Hussein Sabbarach, any effort to intellectually understand of him results in laughing. Not only can't I understand it directly, not only can I understand it indirectly where I'm experiencing only the light of it, but it's not a fully grasped and formed idea but the notion of attempting to understand him is a joke it's a big joke it's impossible to comprehend this is the design or one of the aspects of the design of the Tanya Shara Yechaz Mune Perichas Tes in Yud so I've given you all my introductions right? I've told you everything I wanted to say to you by way of introduction number one I introduced you to the idea of Oyer HaSeichel. Number two, I explained how the concept of Oyer HaSeichel, particularly on the more abstract levels of Shlila, is what truly separates Chakira from Chesidus and Kabbalah. Because Chakira is, re- is pure Seichel, so that when you get to abstract levels, you don't know anything. And in Kabbalah and Chesidus is a spiritual Seichel, a mystical Seichel, and therefore when you don't understand, you have a sense of the Oyer. And the third thing I wanted to explain to you is that even this notion of enlightenment has a limit. The idea that your neshama can give you a light that represents an idea that you have indirectly, that you can't grasp and explain and argue and debate and prove, has a limit. And what's that proof? It works only in Oyer, in Giluyim. Godliness allows you to know itself indirectly. But the Abish to himself, any effort to understanding is a joke. It's impossible to understand. We're now ready to begin our Maimir, our class. And this class is about the third level of Achdus, or the third level of Yediyah. So far we have two Achdus that speak to two levels of Das. Right? You have a tool in your Neshama called Das. There's Das, Tachten, the lower tool of Das, which is between the mind and the heart. In other words, it's an intellectual tool. 
There is a higher das called das Elim, which is between Chochma and Bino, or between Kesen and Chochma, which is not an intellectual tool, it's a solistic, it's a spiritual tool, it's a neshama tool. And just as das Tacht allows you to personalize Yehuda Tato, the Achtos, on a level where the Eibishter exists and the world exists, but the Eibishter is its Balabas, Das Elyon allows you to bring to yourself intellectually Yehuda Elah. And the level of Yehuda Elah, Eneid Mulvadi. The world does not exist and God is its master, all there is is godliness. Or to say it in different words, this world is simply a statement or a giloy or an expression of godliness. In today's Shir, we have a third level. And the third level is called Tachas the ultimate knowledge. And the highest level. This, of course, is brought in Sifri Chikiri. Look at footnote 36. He's mitzayin to Bechinas Elam and the Ikrim and the Shalom. And what's Tachas Hayadiyah? Shalei Neida The ultimate knowledge is to know that you can't know. Or to use the language of the Tanya, any effort to try and know him is a joke. You see, in ignorance... We're all geniuses. You know the old story? <laughs> it's, it's a serious story. Yeah? That, that, that's brought down in Sforim. I think from Chabad sources as well, but not from the Rabbein. That uh, there was a chasane. There's love and a chasane, I believe. And by the chasane, the Reb Shmuel Munkis, the great and deep and holy and humble chasane, Reb Shmuel Munkis acted as the batchan. He was the entertainment. And as such, he, uh, what was the word they used? He roasted. He made jokes about the various guests. But about the Alter Rebbe, he wouldn't say anything. So the Alter Rebbe, the way the story is told, the Alter Rebbe said, what about me? Why don't you speak about me? And the Shmuel Munkas, of course, could not talk about the Alter Rebbe. It was his Rebbe. It was the Alter Rebbe. But the Alter Rebbe insisted. So the Shmuel Munkas said as follows. He says, what I know, you know. What you don't know, I don't know. There are only some things that you know that I don't know. So how big a difference is there between us? This was the Vart. What I know, you know. What you, what the Rebbe doesn't know, and only, only the Abishta knows, I certainly don't know. So the difference is that there's things you know that I don't know. So in two-thirds we're equal, if you will. He was making a point, of course. The point is that everybody's knowledge is limited. And the truth of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, nobody knows. And the wording of the Alter Rebbe, Di Chalein, Atzma Zemusein Zav Baruch Hu, you and you alone, nobody could know. So it says in Sfarim, Tachas Hayadiyya, the end of all knowledge is Shalene Da'achad, that we should know that we don't know him. But of course, there's a very, very big difference between a person who knows a lot, who comes to the conclusion that he doesn't know God, and someone who's never tried. Even though in the end, the Lene Da'achad is on a level of Kola Shemeya Yitzchakle, any effort to try and understand him is a joke, and therefore both are equal. There's an enormous difference between an informed not knowing and an ignorant not knowing. And I'll illustrate it. Yeah. I'll give you an example. There's an expression in English, an educated guess. I recently saw an article where a scientist was arguing that there's no such thing as an educated guess. And it makes sense, because a scientist, from a secular perspective, doesn't believe in the shaman, doesn't believe that, that there's things that you could know before you know them because they exist in your nefesh. So he, he argues scientifically that there's no such thing. But an educated guess is a certain idea in Toyota. What is the meaning of an educated guess? The meaning of an educated guess is that if you are schooled in a particular field, which means you don't really have a lot of knowledge, but you've developed your mind in that area, you know things that you don't yet know. Because your education, your background, your discipline brings on that there are things that you haven't yet brought out of your neshama that are so close to your neshama that you guess right. And an uneducated person is going to guess wrong. I've seen it. I've seen it happen. So an educated guess is not really a guess. An educated guess means it's a premonition that comes to the informed, to the initiated. And the more informed, the more initiated you are, the more refined and precise your guessing is. So that when you're understanding Mamali, and from Mamali you're understanding Seviv, the degree to which you understand Mamali determines the nature of the credibility of your guessing about Seviv. What about Hashem himself? Hashem himself, nobody knows. The effort to understand Hashem is called a joke. So to a great extent, the greatest intellectual, the simplest person are equally removed from the comprehension of the Ebishter. But even there, there's a difference. The more effort you invest in trying to understand the Ruchnius and the Lakus, 
and coming closer to the Yebish, that even though the end is, Tachos the end of all knowledge, it's Shalei Neida Acha, that it's impossible to know a Lakus to the extent that you say, Kol Ashemeya Yitzchak any effort to argue that you can understand the Atzmus and Hus as a joke, still an informed person's not knowing is a different kind of not knowing. Our Maimir offers us something very, very profound, and just to give you a source, it's discussed in Eter, in Eter, in, in, in the world of my mother of Das, I forget which one, the second or the third, my of Das, of Ayechi, and Shmois, and Bishalach and Yisrael, I think. So it's probably in the end of Bishalach. There's four Mamorah Mandas. And one of them, near the end of the Maimah, the Rebbe Rashab brings the idea of Tachas Haidiyah Shalei Neida'acha. And he makes the point, Tachas Haidiyah Shalei Neida'acha. And this itself, Bobe Bechinas Yediyah. You know what it's like? In case you didn't understand what I just said, I'm translating it into English. The, the, the statement is the end of all knowledge is to know that you cannot know. And again, in the wording of the Alter Rebbe, any effort to try and know is a joke. So the Rebbe Rashab says, the end of all knowledge is to know that you cannot know, and this gufa, this itself, you're able to know. The, the illustration for this is the idea which, of course, the Rebbe talked about so much, about Purim. Purim, chayev inish lebesume bepuri adalei yoda. The simcha of Purim is supposed to bring to a person where he's completely out of his mind, doesn't understand. Not chas v'sholem, he says, baruch homan. And the opposite of Baruch for Mardchai. Of course he says Baruch Mardchai. Of course he says it by Homan order. But it's not a level of Yediyah. He says it beyond his understanding. And the goal of Purim is to achieve the Madrig of Loyoda, which is the intellectual parallel of Goidel, which is the whole theme of Purim, like it says in the Maimur, and now is not a Purim class. So the Rebbe says often that the Madrig of Purim is, you should reach the Madrig of Ada Yoda, and does Gufa Zolkum in Bebechinas Yoda. You reach a level where you don't know, and what you don't know, you also know. But you don't know this intellectually. You don't even know this spiritually. You know this in your essence. In other words, there is Yehuda Tato. Yehuda Tato is known in the tool of Das called Das Tachten. That's real understanding. It's so real that the Nefesh Abhamis can understand it as well. Philosophy can understand it also. There is Yehud Elah, which is Achtos. There's nothing besides for God. Yehud Elah is known in a different tool of Das. It's called Das Elyon. Das Elyon is not an intellectual Das. It's a spiritual Das. And Das Elyon, which is a spiritual Das, doesn't know as a concept. It knows as an enlightenment, but it's light. Now, we're introducing a third idea called Tachlas Hayadiyah Shalei Nei Da'achal. The end of all knowledge is know that you don't know, which means Hashem Himself cannot be known at all to the extent that any effort to try knowing him is considered laughable. And it's also known. But it's not known on the level of Das Tachten. It's not known on the level of Das Elyon. It's known on the level of Das, which is one of the Etzim of the Neshama, the Yechida. And even the unknown and the unknowable is somehow known. Or to say it in other words, we're no longer talking about ideas. And we're not even talking about light and enlightenment. We're talking about essence. In other words, there's no communication. There is no revelation. There is nothing that is available to any one of the senses that can detect a light or a life on some esoteric and some spiritual and some sublime level because you're dealing with talking about the essence. And there's a level of Das and the essence of the Neshama that knows that as well. So it's a third Yichud and the third Das. It doesn't even have a label. We don't call it Das Tachten, we don't call it Das Selyan, I'm not sure what we call it. But this is what we're going to be studying tonight. That the highest Madrig of Achtas Hashem is not just to know godliness and its oneness with the world, but to know God Himself. Which is Tachas idea Shalene Da'acha. And just like there is a tool of Das Tachten for Yehuda Tato, and there's a different tool of Das Elyon for Yehuda Elah, there's a third tool of Das, I'm not sure what we would call it, which allows you to know the unknowable. Atzmus of Hussein What the Rebbe calls Pneumius. Let's learn. Okay, let's learn. I've told you what the Maim is going to say, now let's read it. it says the Rebbe in Pedig Vavandam, however, Gam even the higher unity which says there's nothing but godliness. Shemitzad das elyin, that the ability to know that your existence is nothing other than the Abishtar. 
is only knowable on the tool of Das, on the level of Elyon, because Das Tachten needs to understand. And only Das Tachten can experience enlightenment. That Afsham Agas Bebechin Asair. And the nature of the understanding of Yehudi law, as it touches the tool, which is called Das Elyon, is on a level of Oir, enlightenment. And to use my language, you don't understand it at all. But you're experiencing the enlightenment, says the Rebbe Mekomakim, nevertheless. The very fact that the truth of Yehudi law, which says that besides Rashem there is nothing, you experience on a level of Oir, which is higher than Seichel, that makes it Chitzenias. The very fact that there is a keli called Das Tachten, which can detect the oil of the neshama that represents the madreg of Yehudi law, makes it superficial. Because if it would be the deepest thing, it couldn't be detected by another. Continues the Rebbe, and he says, Ach yesh madreg gimel bedas. As if a third level of das, and the meaning of these words yesh gimel madreg gimel das means just like das Tachten is one tool. And Das Elyon is a different tool, and it's situated in a different place of the Nefesh. The Das we're now describing, and I'm not sure what its name is going to be, is a third tool, and it's in a different level of the Nesham. And it's the Das which conforms, or is related to the statement, The end of all knowledge is to know that you can't know. And again, what I added from the Shariah Vemuna is that the effort to attempt to know what is called Hashemei Yitzchakle, it's laughable. And the idea of the Ebesh to himself, which any effort to understand is laughable, you can know that you cannot know, and the not knowing is also a knowledge. Because there is a keli of Das that corresponds to Etzim. Not to save it, but to etz. Not to oil, but to atzmas. Vainu lahakir, ulahargish esein sof. To recognize and have a sense of the ain save. And in this case, you don't mean oil ain save, you talk about atzmas ain save. Shalai neidah b'chinah sasaga klal, which is not available through reach directly, which would be das tachten, or indirectly, which would mean das elyon at all. Dehine. And the Rebbe explains. And again, what I'm going to now read is what I shared by way of introduction, and I think I did the right thing by introducing it first. It'll make the Maimir flow, and it'll hopefully give us an easier time getting through it. Beis hadeis the das tachtem das elyon. We're talking about two types of knowledge: a lower knowledge, which is knowing what's comprehensible, and a higher knowledge, which is knowing what can be experienced as an enlightenment. They're all connected to understanding. Now I'm going to use a form to bring it into uh, focus. The form is. You're here, Hashem is here, and you are gaining a, a, a connection to Him by, through the tool of intellect. In other words, there's three things. There's the, the knower, there is the known, and there is the knowledge. Das Tach and Das are very different. But in both of them, there is you, there is the Ebishter, and there's the way you relate to Him. El Shachilik Benayim, where the difference is only that im hadas umitzad asagas achiu. If you're understanding Hashem directly, so it's known in the tool of das tachten, which is intellectual. She asagas be malik kalalmin v'seviv kalalmin. As we learned earlier before, it doesn't mean stam seviv kalalmin. He means seviv kalalmin. Hashayech le malik kalalmin. As we did two shiurim ago, says the Rebbe Shazel we in das tachten. The tool of Das Tachten is situated between the mind and the heart. In other words, it's intellectual. The tool of Das Tachten can know the godliness of Mamalek Alam and the godliness of Sevev Kalam, which is Mislabesh Mamalek On the other hand, Oyadah, Shumitada Sagas Ashlila, knowing indirectly. Shakula can make Lach Shiv, when you're understanding godliness indirectly, you understand that there's nothing besides for godliness. It's not all that the world exists and God is its master. But the world is nothing other than an expression of the Eibishtesh, who in Das Elyon, this can only be known on the level of tool of Das, which is called Elyon. In other words, it's not intellectual, it's spiritual. And Das Elyon is keli for oyed, for enlightenment. Says the Rebbe, Avod is a third Achtos, and parallel to this third Achtos, there's a third Das. In other words, Das would mean the keli, and Achtos would be the idea. Tachas Adas, the end of all Das, the highest level of Das. Tachas Ayadia. Shalei Neida Acha, turn to page Chavov now. Humashe Etzem Anefesh, the Pin Teleyid. Makiru Margish Atzma Saint Saf, recognizes and feels. These are all terms associated with Das. Hakoda, Hargosha, His Amtos, Ri'ia, these are terms associated with Das all over. Hasidis, the Rebbe just brings these words. I'm sure there's a preciseness in why he brings each word in each case, but we're going to be general. 
that although shaloy neido masakat cannot be known, cannot be apprehended. Gam leib even shalasagas ashlila. Not only in an indirect knowledge, which is called an oyer, an enlightenment, or a hafla, which appeals to the level of das called das elyon. We're not talking about oyer. We're talking about it. And we're not talking about das elyon. We're talking about tachas idea shaloy neidach. It's a third das which knows a third level of truth, which is completely beyond the parameters of understanding. Neither directly nor indirectly. Not understanding, not being enlightened. It's being one with. Now, how's that possible? How's that possible? Right? The Altarebbe says, Kol Yitzchak Trying to understand God is a joke. We call it, Leinei Da'ach. Can't know. And how can the Leinei Da'ach become a Yeda? And there's a very simple answer to the question. And the answer is very posh. So long as we conceive of knowing as though you're knowing something outside of yourself, this is impossible and a joke. In other words, if we retain the model that I described a few minutes ago, Hashem is here, I am here, and the tool of knowledge binds me with Him, this is impossible. But in the end, we are Hashem. Everything is Asha. If you can tap into your deepest essence, that your deepest essence and the Abish's essence are one and the same. So you're not knowing something other. When you're not knowing something other, you're in effect knowing yourself, the limitation of your dia goes away. The limitation, the Das Tachni can understand, and Das Elin cannot understand, but it can be enlightened. But both of them, both of them are relating to something which is outside of itself, whether it's seichel or it's eid, is a detail. On this highest level of das, you know by knowing you. In other words, the end of all knowledge is know that you don't know in as much as he is separate from you. But the effort at trying to know what you cannot know as something separate from you, and in the words of the Alter Rebbe, relating, trying to understand that Hashem as something other than yourself, intellectually is a joke, but when you, when you concede, when you admit, when you submit, that it cannot be understood as something other, I can only find it inside myself, then the unknowable becomes known. Not as an idea, not even as an enlightenment, as a truth. And the Rebbe now struggles with language. So it's gam loy be eifin dash He says like this, I'm Moshe. I'll try and explain it. Hargosh has aleif. There is a notion of the feeling of the heart. Now, when it says over here, Hargosh has aleif, it doesn't mean emotions. Because emotions are not only relating to things outside of yourself. They're superficial and they're demonstrative and they're external and they're, of course, very limited. Hargosh has aleif means what Hasid is called pnimius aleif. There's chitzenius aleif and pnimius aleif. The outer heart responds to your mind. The inner heart responds to your soul. The essence of your heart, the Nekudus Pnimius Atmos Halev, is your soul. So when it says over here, Gotcha Salev, he means not the conscious heart, the, the heart which is in Nefesh Ruch Nisham, means the heart of Yechida. Your Pnimius Halev is one with the Pnimius of Elokus, Tzur Levavi Vechelki. And it knows the Eivishter as it knows itself. Just like a person knows himself on the deepest level. How do you know yourself? What's the difference between the you know you and anybody else knows you? So of course, you, you understand yourself better, you feel yourself better, and of course, above all else, you justify, you excuse yourself better than anybody else will excuse yourself. But there's a level of your relationship, what you have with yourself, which is not in any way intellectual or sensual or enlightened. It's just a me. I am me, and I know me as such. And the Rebbe says, The heart, the inner heart, knows the bitterness of its soul, meaning the inner soul. We're not talking about Naran. And you'll see later, we're not even talking about Chaya. We're talking about Yechida. The point is, the idea that there is a knower and a known and a two of knowledge has broken down. There's not a Yedei and a Yedu and a Mada. There's one thing. The knowledge, the knower and the known are one. You know Hashem because you are Him. There's no understanding. There's no intellectual reach. There isn't even a sense of source or cause for why this is. A person can know himself from the inside. 
מפני שהדבר נגיע אליי בעצם נפשי, things that touch the very essence of your neshama, you know on an essence level. Again, the argument is, there is an idea of having information about yourself that comes from outside of you, just the way you would research and get data about another person. So, to use philosophical language, first you didn't know, and then you found it out, the same is true in a person's relationship with himself, there's things about yourself that yesterday you didn't know, and now you know. then there's some things that you always know, because you don't know them by researching them. You just know them in, in, in your essence, in a visceral way, in a gut way, in a pneumious way. And at the highest level, this is Yechidah. And the spiritual parallel of this. And of course, bear in mind that the ultimate purpose of this conversation is to say what? That the Abish said himself, that loy ne'da'acha, that cannot be known directly, which means understood, or das tacht. It cannot be known indirectly, in other words, experiencing the enlightenment of, in other words, das elyon. But rather, it's the essence, which is lay neda achat, cannot be known, is also known. But it's known as you know yourself. You're not knowing him as something other than you. You're just in touch with yourself in the deepest levels where you and him are one. Huin yin aiskashus atzmi da neshama. It's the notion of the level of the neshama, called etzim, which philosophically means the way it exists in relationship with itself, is bound to the etzem, to godliness, as godliness exists in relationship with itself. As I explained to you in last year, every level in say the Nishtaslus is paralleled in the Nishama, including Atzmas, including the Eibishter himself. So if you can get in touch with the Eibishter himself, which is inside your Nishama, you can know the essence of the Eibishter, but you can't call that Yediyah, not on a level of Hasoge, not on a level of Hafla, not on a level of understanding, not on a level of enlightenment, but on a level of knowing like you know yourself. And this is what the Rebbe, Rebbe, Rebbe is trying to explain. It comes from the very essence of the Neshama, and it's not based on a contemplation. It isn't even indirect contemplation, which brings you to Hafla. And of course, this word Hafla is the precise Hasidic term for the enlightenment that I've been describing all evening and the last year. And here there's a Yedah. In other words, to know Mamala Kalaman, you learn and you contemplate. To know Seva Kalaman, you then learn and contemplate more and extrapolate away from what you knew before. To know Atmos, there's no process. There's no earlier steps. It's just the idea that a person knows the Lakus by knowing himself on the deepest levels. Va'in Yin Bazeh explains the Rebbe, the Da'as Tachtein, the level of knowledge which can relate to ideas that are intellectual. Shub'ev, just like a understands Hashem directly because it's not really understanding Hashem, it's understanding the world. and the need for the world to have a creator, and an imminent and involved God that oversees everything, which is the basis for prophecy, and for miracles, and for divine communication, and Hashem knowing what we're doing, and reward and punishment, and all the rest. The lowest levels of the neshama can understand it. Das Tachta means the levels of godliness that you could know intellectually, And the level of godliness, you know, intellectually, are the lowest levels of godliness. And then you have, of course, Das Eli, which is the tool that allows you to know things you can't understand, but that you can experience the enlightenment of. Hu l'may l'may naran, it's beyond the levels of the neshama called naran, which is the infam chaya, as you see momentarily, kavedish v'das elyin, the work of trying to pursue a sense of Yehud Allah, which is going to speak to the tool of Das, which is called Elyein, Hibidarech Re'u, so the Libra has to do with the will of the heart, in other words, it's beyond the mind. Shabbat Mitzad Makif Tachayim. The level of the Neshama called Chaya is beyond your intellect. The level of the Neshama called Chaya is beyond your intellect is the basis for enlightenment. That's where the Oyer HaSeichel comes to you. And you can know it in your tool of Das Elyein, because you don't understand it, and yet you have a sense of it. Says the Rebbe, I will laugh up again, but even Das Elyon, which is known on the level of the Neshama called Chaya. And it's Bederach Oyer, and not Bederach Islapshus. Harez Abba, the Asag of Hezbonus has a relationship to understanding. And it happens through first understanding Mamali, and then extrapolating from Mamali to Seyve. And since it has an indirect relationship to intellect, it's considered Chitzenius. In other words, it's you knowing Hashem, as Hashem is something other than you. The ultimate is Boninus, which brings to Das Elyon and Yechudei Eloh and Yediyas HaShlila and the flaw that it brings is Lei B'dargis HaLakus HaMislabish Be'elemes It's not the godliness which is revealed in the world in the way that you can grasp it Ela B'dargis HaLakus HaMufla Be'elemes And again, Mufla means you experience it's light and you can't put it into words Omna Madrega HaGimel B'daz It's the third Das and it doesn't even have a name Right? There's Das Tachten There's Das Elyon and then there's what? Das <laughs> Elyon, Elyon, it doesn't have a name. 
But this das is tachlas ha'yedia, the ultimate knowledge, which is knowing the unknowable, knowing something which the Alter Rebbe and Tanya calls, trying to know it. It's a joke, it's a laugh. You can know that too. Because you're not knowing it as you know something outside of yourself, you're knowing it intimately. He was at Mark of the Yechido. She'en Ebar, this Bon Scholar has no relationship to intellect. And perhaps there's no difference between Yedi and Shlila when it comes to Etzim. In other words, it's not like, even though I told you before that I gave you the whole illustration of the educated guesser, that there's a very big difference between an ignorant person who doesn't know God and an informed person who doesn't know God. The implication here is that ultimately the degree to which we don't know Hashem is equal. The neshama in relationship with itself. The only words I have to say this is. Everything is God. And there's a level in the Yiddish and Neshama where the everything is God is experienced, is revealed, and a Yid can tap into that. A Yid can sense that. Not on an intellectual level, not on an enlightenment level, but on a level which the Rebbe calls Makir o Margish. Knowing yourself. Umitzad said that on this third level, Nasas Gama, Koravar Goshabat Masein Tzav. You can have a recognition and a feel for Ein Tzav on a level of Atmos, that means Godliness says it exists by itself. It's not or not revealed in Kalim, which is Hasaga. It's not and revealed in Eid, which is Hafla. It's Etzim. It's not reached intellectually, directly, indirectly. You know it because God touches the essence of your Neshama. You know the essence of God because you are the essence of God. In the famous Lashem, which is brought in Hasidus from the Rasag, Lu to know God, you have to be God. Now, of course, the meaning of that statement, of that phrase, Lu to know God, you have to be God, really is what? Since you're not God, you can't know Him. But we know the Mishpat of the Rebbe Rashab, who said that when I sit by me in my room, Shabbos and Devri, and I learned the Kutateira, is Dan Yedaitev Avisif. He's so one with the Lakus that he knows him. This idea of Yedaitev Avisif, knowing God, by being God, this is Tachas idea, Shalei Neida Acha, and this itself is an Eifin of Yedia. Shahu Yen Chavu Kodavu Kabach, which is the level where you want with the Lakus. Says the Rabbi Vedas, or this level, Magas Leirak Bechitzen Yaseh. This does not reach only peripheral light. Now, the meaning of the word peripheral light in this case means light which communicates with another. In other words, the Madreg of Eir, which is Giloi, so there is a source, there is a light, and there is a reflector, can only know Chitzen The level of Pnimias does not have a source, there's no light, there's no reflector, it's either one or it doesn't exist. Elegam be pnimis, the eid does exist on a pnimis level, which means not a source which is radiating a light, but getting in touch with the light as it is in the source. If you say it in Medusha Magaz be pnimis at the klaus, which is the highest level of atak, and I don't know what this word the klaus means. Shu atzmus samhus ain't say, but a whole commission is by my men akedim. Okay, stop right here. So the Rebbe has taken us on a journey. The journey began with the proposal that there's a Daaselian and the Daastach. The very beginning of this journal argue, journey argued that Daastachtin is Nivra and Daaselian is Bayri. The creations know Daastachtin, the Ebishta knows Daas, Elkus knows Daaselian. Then we went on to say that in Elkus itself, in Bayri itself, there is Daastachtin and Daaselian. And then we're on to say that in Nivra itself, there's Das Tachna Das Elyon. And two things. Number one, a Yid in his Avoida can do the Avoida of Yichud HaZatoh and Yichud Elah. And number two, in a Yid's Neshama, there is the Das Tachna, which can tolerate the Yichud HaZatoh, and the Das Elyon, which can tolerate the Yichud Elah. And now we added a third Yidiyah, which can know what's even higher than Yichud Elah. So we're arguing that Das Tachna and Das Elyon exist in everything, in creation alone, and in creator alone, and in Avaida alone. Now there's one more thing we need to do, which is the beginning and the end of this Maimed, which uh, we did not do in the beginning. So let's start, go back to page your tests, and we'll read. In the beginning, Elikim created heaven and earth. So Pirish Rashi, everybody knows what Rashi says. Oh, but Rabbi Yitzchak says, Rabbi Yitzchak. Lo yhoye tzarech l'aschal sa teira, elamechei, which is alachem. The teira should have really started with the mitzvahs. 
And the first mitzvah is, of course, Kiddush HaChedish. HaChedish is Olochem. So the question that Rabbi Yitzchak is asking is, Matam Pasach Vibresh, is why start with the account of creation? And of course, that is followed up by the whole Sefer HaYosher, which talks about Adam and Neach and Avraham, Yitzchak and Yankov and the Shift they caught, and so forth. He should have started with the mitzvah satir. And the teret says, He wants to show the strength of his actions. To justify how he gave them the land of the seven nations. Why? are going to come along and there's nothing new under the sun. They're still coming along. And they're saying to the Yisrael, to the Jewish people, you're thieves, you're robbers. You've stolen the land of the seven nations. The people lived there before. So the answer is going to be the whole world belongs to the Abishtan. Who Broy created it, Vinos, Nalash Yashabaina, he gave it to him he saw fit to give it to, and then it says, But it say ne nasna lahem, he chose to give it to them, U but it say ne not la mehem, Venasna Lanu. Then he chose, he will to take it from them and give it to us. This is the classic Rashi, which Rebbe of course brought so many times because of the tragedy of the Shlemus Aritz fiasco of land for peace. And the Rashi is saying, you have to have the story of creation to say, listen, the world belongs to him. It may have been yours yesterday. Today it's ours. God gave it to us. So the Rebbe now has two questions. And the first question is, hey, Nemes, it may be true. To respond to the complaint of the Umes Elam. That says your thief thoroughly is gracious, but Lakim, it's not enough that the Abish gave us a Tera. You have to know that the Abish created the world and it's Yeshmiyain. And it's his. It should be a tradition, an oral tradition that God created the world. The idea that the Tera has to tell us that Hashem created the world. Tera teaches us mitzvahs. So it's true, we need to know categorically that the Abish created the world and created the world in such a way that it's from him and is him and is dependent upon him constantly and therefore there's nothing to the world other than his will but why put it in the Tata put it in some other book second question I'm skipping a line to argue that the world belongs to Hashem imminently now and therefore you could take it and give it to us even though he originally gave it to them all you have to say that the world is his right when the guy comes along and says, you're a thief, we say, listen, go talk to the Yebishter. But why do you have to say he gave it to them? Now, I'm just going to cheat and tell you right now. The word Nasna is going to represent Daselian. And the word Yashar is going to represent which we learned earlier tonight. So I'm sort of giving you a hint, a heads up at how these questions are going to be resolved based on the three days that we have, Das, Takhn, and Das, Elian. And the Takhl um as they're found in enlightening this Medrish about creation. So now go to page Chavav. And let's read the end of the Maimuzel. Much across the Pesach says, B'Resh is Baruch Likim. Upirish Rashi Lo Yoy Yitzarech Laschal Satera Laschal Satera Ela Mechedish Is Alachem Matam Pesach B'Resh Is Chuli. The world should have started with mitz. The Tera should have started with mitzvahs. Why did it start with the creation of account? And the answer is to teach us the Koyach of Hakadosh Baruch. And because of his strength, he's a Balabas. And because of the Balabas, he can do what he wishes. And he gave it to them, took it from them, and gave it to us. So the question becomes: Why is it in the Tera, and why the new ones? So the Rebbe proceeds by saying, Mavur Ba'akeda, it's brought in their Sefer Akeda, which is a Peter Shan Chumish to a famous philosopher, which is cited in Chasidus often, Shesh Be'ez Efanim, there's two methods, Hayyadam Yechelim Lida, Safla Asal Akuzma, Hanoga Asalim. You look at the world and you see God, there's two ways of seeing God in the world. Ha'alafa Adi'an Hagativis. Nature itself is a great miracle. And if you pay attention to miracle, you see how nature itself is a big miracle. Says the Rebbe, Shabo, Mitzadag, Salukus, Hamislabish, Behelim, is the idea that nature reveals the Abishter, is the way God is manifest in the world, Shu, Winyin, Das, Dach. Now bear in mind, or keep appreciating what I'm telling you over and over again. There's two things here there is the data, and then there is what processes the data. The data is, you look at nature, you see God. What process? The data does Tachten. It can be intellectually understood that the world reflects HaKadosh Baruch. 
And I day han hagen nisus, and there is the supernatural conduct of the Yevish, their miracles, shabo amit adelukus am muflam elmis, which is based on godliness, which is called hafla, enlightenment, and not comprehension. Shazal winyan das elyan. And again, there's two ideas here. There's what we know and how we know it. We know that godliness is beyond the world in a way of enlightenment, and the tool which holds that kind of data is called das elyan, higher das. Obeklalos, in other words, that is a hefesh ben chedish tishle ve chedish nis. Tishrei is the, mir- the month of, mir- of nature, and this is the month of miracles, and they're connected to the two levels of the presence of Elikus in the world, Hislapshus and Hafla, Das Tachn and Das Eli. So the Rebbe says three lines in the bottom of the page, Chavav, Zehu Masha Pirush Rashi. That's what Rashi is saying. That what? There's a level of understanding, Hashem, that says there is a world, God is its master. There's a higher level of understanding which says there is nothing but God. And the world's oneness with him is Eneid Milvadi. The former is known on the level of Das Tachten. The latter is known on the level of Das Elyon. Says Rab Yitzchak, why bother with the lower Yedia? Taylor should speak only about the higher Yedia. Since we're dealing with Taylor, you should not start the Taylor by dealing with Yichud, Tato, and Das Tachten, but rather Miachelich Alachem. Says Rabbi Dekiv and Chateir and Yonah Avedi Dichud Dilak and Alsif. Hey, Tate is fundamentally the concept of Yichud Tato as was discussed before in Perek Hey. In Kain, how you tell the Chalas Chamechin this is Alachem. The Tate should begin with the relationship that the world has with Hashem from the Tate's perspective. All there is is miracles. All there is is godliness and the level of Afla which speaks to the level of Yedia called Daselin. This is the supernatural conduct. The wondrous level of godliness which you know not intellectually in a way of comprehension, but by way of enlightenment. And therefore the question becomes Why does Tehidah speak about Yehud Tato and Das Tachten? Yehud Tato and Das Tachten is a welt It's even for Goyim Lahav. Tehidah is Yehud Eloh. Tehidah is Das or metaret, second line from the top of Yitzchak Zayin, and there's a teretz. That mishum shekeach ma'isav higid la'ami lost us l'hem nachlas goyim. The Eibishter wants us to know his strength so we can explain it to the goy. And explain it to the goy to justify why the Eibishter took what was theirs and gave it to us. Now, before you continue, what does this mean? The Eibishter doesn't create goyim for them to be destroyed. The Eibishter creates goyim for them to serve him also. And on some level, a guy can only understand Yehuda Tata, can only understand Da'astach. So there's something very meaningful here. It's not just about the land of Israel and the conquest. It's about the idea of elevating the guy. And since the guy can only know Da'astach, the Teda has to, I'm sorry, Yehuda Tata, the Teda has to speak to Yehuda Tata, which appeals to the level of Da'as called Da'astach. And the Rebbe doesn't say that exactly, he says that approximately. It's elevating the world, and specifically the guy. And when you're talking about the world, you're talking about the Goy, all he can know is Yehud Tato. And since he can only know it, Yehud Tato, he has, can know it in the tool of Das Tacht. So the Moed and the The Teda begins with Bereshis not because of our conquest of Eretz Yisrael. The Teda begins with Bereshis to educate the Goy, to educate world, to uplift world at the level of reality that says I exist and God is my master also becomes uplifted into Achtas Hashem as it appeals to the tool of Das Tacht. So that's a kasha and that's a teretz. Right? What was the question? Why bother with Yehud Tato and Das Tacht and Teres and miracles? Yehud Tato and Das Elyon. And the answer is, Keach, Maisav, Higid, Lahamid, Lasa, Nachlas, Goyim. We have to inherit Goyim. We have to inherit Goyishkat. We have to inherit Deim Mitzamei Chai and bring the Abish to all of those things. All of those things are at best able to know Yehud Tato and the Madreg of Das Tacht. So Teres speaks about them as well. Bereshis Baralikim. But if you stop right here, you would say that the entire discussion of Bereshis is for Goyim. The entire discussion of Bereshis is for the elevation of sparks. But as far as Yidna is concerned and Taira is concerned, you should skip it. It says the Rebbe, not so. The age says, but there's a second point. I'm sorry. The Gam, moreover, four lines in the top. Inyan Zeshayach Taira. Don't think that the discussion of Das Tachten. I'm sorry, Yehuda Tata, which speaks to Das Tachten, which is Masav Higid La'amidas Nachos Goyim, Birur. It's only for the Goy, only for the Birur. 
but it's for Taita as well. You know why? On the one hand, in order to reach the Goyen, Goyen Shkait, you need Taita. In other words, if it was not written in the Taita, Los is Hem Nachlas Goyim. Yehuda Tator and Das Elyon cannot be mevarad in the world, cannot elevate a Goy without the help of Yehuda Elah. So the Taita includes Keach Masav Higid Lami, Yehuda Tator and Das Tachten, to help the Yehuda Tator and Das Tachten affect the Goy and be mevarad in the world. But that's only half of it. There's another half. What's the other half? The Eidz Eis, moreover, that Yehuda Tator brings to Yehuda Elah. The elevation of Goyim and Birurim, which is Yehuda Tato and Das Tachten, sets up Yehuda Elah and Das Elyon. Sharia Kavon, Abba Vedad Yehuda Tato, he. The Nayid starts out first on the level of Yehuda Tato, which means he says, I exist, and the Abish is my Balabos, and this I can understand in my mind, which is called Yehuda Tato, Das Tachten, and I deze Yagiyach Akach. This is the first step, which brings us to the second step, which is the Avoid of Yehuda Elah, which is known at the level of Das, which is called Das Elyon. Vim Canaan, therefore, it's not only for the sake of the world and the Goya and the Birurim that Yehud the Tato is included in the Tata, which is Yehud Elah, but Faket. Yehud the Tato is written in the Tata to bring us to Yehud Elah. Yid reaches Yehud Elah and Das Elyon by beginning Yehud the Tato and Das Tacht. Vim Canaan, accordingly, I bevade Tarach Nasin as Keich, me Yehud Elah, Yehud the Tato. Yehud Elah gives the power of Yehud the Tato. Bakhtei Yishuach Lagim is Yehud Elah. That ultimately you should reach Yehud Elah no matter how far. V'lachein Pasach beBereishis the Teira begins at Bereishis. In other words, Shuvin Yaido and the Sinas Keich Meyat Teira. The Teira in four Hayra, a lesson and a provision of strength that we should do Yehud the Tato, which will bring us to Yehud Elah and Das Elyon. Lavei the Yehud the Tato. Shaidei is the Efsh Lagia the Avei Yehud the Tato. Gam Yehud Elah and Das Elyon. And then the Rebbe says V'gam no Madrei Gagim Olad. It's a gradation. Yehud the Tato and Das Tachten brings it to Yehud the Law and Das Elyon, which brings it to Tachas Hayadir, which is Lein Neidu Acham. And he says, "V'zeu Mashem Mesayim ve'Pirashashi u'Nesona Lasha Yosha be'Erov." Says the Rebbe, "Nesona Davke is b'Derech Matana that's Yehud the Law." And the next line, "Yosher be'Ein of Yosher," says the Rebbe, "is Yosher Yachaz u'Faneime." That when you go straight, you meet Pnimi the Atzma Saint Zof, which is Madrei Gagim Olad Das. I'm not explaining this. But what the Rebbe is saying is that these words, Nosno Lasher Yoshar, Be'ein of Nosno, is Da is Yehudi Ilo and Da is Tachten, and Yoshar is the Madrig of Tachas Ayadir, which is Shalei Neidach. So one brings the second, which brings the third. Hainu, three lines at the end of the Pedic. That I deze Shesh Nesinus Kech Me Atere Gamal Avid Yehudi Atere helps us achieve the level of Yehudi Tato, which is known on Da is Tachten. Or the Efsh that he gets a kach laveda the Yehudi Elah, which is known the level of the Aselian, which is Chaya, and then finally you reach the Madrega of Tachas Hayadir, which is Lei Neida Acha, which is the Mak of the Yehida, which is Chavuka Dvuka Bach. Now I'm sorry I didn't sit on this for 45 minutes, but I think we're all pretty exhausted at this point. And maybe the next time we'll start the next Maimon. Lei Neida, Pas Chaliyo, you just kiss. And that Maimon is Muga, so if you think these Memorim are hard, wait till we get to those.